Uh, very few franchises have had the global cultural impact like Star Wars has had, capturing audiences of all ages through films, televisions, novels, and comics for over 40 years. It seemed more than appropriate to devote at least one cinema series event to a Star Wars film. And what better film to focus on than the one that started it all, The Phantom Menace. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Star Wars A New Hope, uh, the first film released in the saga, opening in theaters on May 25th, 1977, over 40 years ago. Uh, it was written and directed by the one and only George Lucas, starring Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Peter Cushing, Alec Guinness, etc., etc. Uh, a long time ago in this very galaxy, the, uh, John, go back one. There you go. <laughs> a long time ago in this very galaxy, there was a period of time called the 70s. It was an interesting time in our world's history with the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal. The world was becoming a bitter, cynical place, and that translated into the films Hollywood made. Films like Chinatown, The Towering Inferno, and The French Connection weren't exactly upbeat and feel-good films. Hollywood needed fresh young filmmakers to bring some fresh new life to screen and connect to audiences again. So they turned to film schools where they would find brilliant students beginning to sharpen their craft like Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, and George Lucas. George Lucas grew up in Modesto, California, reading adventure stories and watching serialized programs on television. When he came of age, he went to study film at the University of South Carolina. Director Irving Kirshner was one of his teachers and has said he always had a unique vision and was keen to think outside of the box. For example, his student film was supposed to be five minutes long and he turned in 20 minutes. Of course, when George Lucas does that, he becomes a college prodigy, but when I do it, I'm on thin ice. <laughs> Thankfully, his professors loved it and his approach to technology and storytelling drew a lot of attention. In 1969, he founded his own production company in San Francisco with Francis Ford Coppola. His first film was a remake of his student film, THX 1138. Warner Brothers provided the funding and immediately demanded their money back on seeing the final product. Thus, end of production company. After that, George created the company Lucasfilm. His next film, American Graffiti, came out in 1973 and was shot in 28 days and under a million dollars. It was the third highest grossing film that year. The success gave him the ability to shop around the treatment for a film called The Star Wars. He had always wanted to do a space opera in the vein of Flash Gordon, but sci-fi wasn't very big at the time. The most success the genre had was 2001 A Space Odyssey and Planet of the Apes. Sci-fi was a very doom and gloom type of genre, often predicting an apocalyptic end for humanity and the world. Lucas wanted to inject some positivity into sci-fi. Several people saw his idea of a galactic fairy tale weird, and major studios like Universal and United Artists turned him away. The project found a home at 20th Century Fox thank to, thanks to new creative arts affairs executive Alan Ladd Jr. He had a real eye for recognizing talent, and while he didn't believe in the script, he believed in Lucas. Lucas began writing the screenplay in 1974. He was heavily influenced by the work of Joseph Campbell. For those who are still studying English, he is the one who created the hero's journey formula, or, predict, or laid out the hero's journey formula. The influences of myth and world religions and works such as King Arthur, Beowulf, and the Odyssey were other influences of Lucas. While the screenplay went through a lot of changes, the only thing that remained constant from the very beginning was the antagonist, Darth Vader. Originally, Luke Skywalker was called Luke Starkiller and was a 60-year-old rebellion general, and Han Solo was at one point green-skinned with gills. This first draft was about 200 pages. What happened next is he took the first third of the screenplay and decided to make that into a film. And I'm sure you can guess what happened to the other two-thirds of that screenplay. George Lucas did a lot of things during production that made the studio nervous. For example, he wanted to cast unknowns for the three leads, Luke, Leia, and Han. 24-year-old Mark Hamill had mainly worked on television prior to being cast, his biggest claim to fame being a recurring role on the soap opera General Hospital. Practically every actress in Hollywood auditioned to play Leia, but the role went to Carrie Fisher, the daughter of actress Debbie Reynolds and singer Eddie Fisher, for her ability to give Leia that feel of sweetness and authority. Harrison Ford had only done minor acting work until Lucas cast him in American Graffiti a few years prior but he did not want to use Ford a second time. Instead, he hired him to feed the lines to the actors who were auditioning. Eventually, though, he won Lucas over, and the part of Han Solo was his forevermore. 
For Obi-Wan Kenobi, there was a real need to get a well-established actor in the wise old mentor role, and they selected British actor Alec Guinness. Alec Guinness was a major influence on the production. He was a prime example of professionalism to everyone, even on the most unpleasant of shooting days, and there were quite a few unpleasant shooting days. The rest of the cast always brought their A-game when he was around. Kenny Baker, who was a three and a, f three and a half feet tall comedian, was selected to play R2-D2, and Anthony Daniels was selected to play C-3PO. 3PO has no movable mouth or blinking eyes. He's mostly expressionless, so it was lucky for them Daniels trained as a mime. Peter Mayhew was a, was a hospital orderly when he went up for the part of Chewbacca. Chewbacca needed to be a sort of imposing presence, and fortunately Mayhew is about seven feet tall. He stood up to greet George Lucas. Lucas took one look at him and said he was Chewbacca. What's kind of hilarious is Chewbacca actually has lines of English dialogue in the screenplay, and Mayhew would recite it to his cast members, and they just dubbed the Wookiee noises in post. Bodybuilder and monster movie alum David Prowse was hired to play Darth Vader, but as we all know, that's not his voice on the screen. That is classically trained actor James Earl Jones. Lucas never intended to use Prowl's voice. He always wanted a darker, more sinister voice for the iconic antagonist. Hollywood artist Ralph McQuarrie was brought on to help design the look of the film. In 1975, the company Industrial Light and Magic was formed to create the special effects of the film. A special effects company was sort of unheard of at the time. It was mostly done in-house on the studio lot. A lot of models and practical effects were used in the film, as well as some puppets and stop-motion animation. The CGI would come later in Lucas's or remastered editions. Star Wars was not going to be a cheap film to make. The studio set the budget at about uh, $8.5 million. In March of 1976, filming began in North Africa, and on day one, the Sahara was hit with its first major rainfall in 50 years. <laughs> Weather was often working against them, as it normally does on a film set. By mid-morning, it was about 100 degrees in Tunisia. It was a bit of a, relief, of a relief when they moved to sound stages in London, but not a very big relief. The production was riddled with problems from malfunctioning props to electrical failures. They were barely on schedule. And meanwhile, ILM was trying to create special effects that had never been done before. They went way over budget, and Fox was not happy. To top it all off, Lucas was hospitalized at one point due to stress and was diagnosed with hypertension and exhaustion. But that did not stop him from working overtime. George Lucas was a very impatient man and very stone-faced on set. To contrast, the cast and rest of the crew acted very lightheartedly. They all had doubt the film would be a success, saw it as a sort of children's film, and didn't take their work too seriously, except for when Alex Guinness was around. They would always try to make George crack on the set. Final scenes of the film were shot pretty quickly. In fact, production was split into three units. Regardless, the film was never going to make its original release of Christmas 1976, and was pushed back to May 25, 1977. There was still doubt the film would even reach theaters then. The first cut of the film was a disaster. It lacked severe pacing issues, and Lucas passed it over to three editors, Richard Chu, Paul Hirsch, and his wife, Marcia. Here's the wife's got to come in and clean him after the husbands. Am I right, ladies? <laughs> Needless to say, Star Wars was saved in the editing. Ben Burt was the sound designer on the film, and he had a near impossible task in creating sound effects for things that didn't exist in the real world, like a lightsaber or the roar of a Wookiee or the breathing of Darth Vader. Speaking of lightsabers, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on how those iconic weapons were brought to life. They were basically white wooden rods that broke a lot on set, and then the lights and colors were animated after the fact. At one point, they had reflective lights in them, but they bounced off everything on set and they looked awful. But of course, the film really came to life with the music of composer John Williams. He had just won an Oscar for his work on Jaws, and prior to Jaws, he worked a lot in television, like shows like Lost in Space, and that kind of came in handy. Williams' score brought the film and the franchise to life, and he created one of the most iconic film scores of all time. He recorded over 12 days with the London Symphony Orchestra. Traditional symphonic orchestra for a film was a risk at the time. I mean, it was just the 70s, everyone just wanted disco and all that. Um, insiders foretold doom at the box office for Star Wars, but a slow fan base was growing due to the marketing. In 1976, a novelization based on the screenplay was published, and a comic deal was set up with Stan Lee and Marvel. The film was even advertised at San Diego Comic-Con back in the day, back when Comic-Con wasn't as huge, but a fan base was growing regardless. 
Star Wars was met with universal and criti universal critical and commercial acclaim. It premiered the Wednesday before Memorial Day in 32 theaters, expanding to 43 on Friday and a wider release later on. It replaced Jaws as the highest grossing film of all time six months into its release. Jaws gave birth to the idea of the summer blockbuster and in a way Star Wars sort of solidified it. Rotten Tomatoes didn't exist back then, but it's got a 93% certified fresh rating. It o earned over $775 billion at the worldwide box office. It was nominated for 10 Oscars at the Academy Awards and won six of them, and a special Lifetime Achievement Oscar was also given to the sound designer on the film. Thanks to the success of Star Wars, 20th Century Fox's stock price doubled to a record high. The film boosted Fisher, Hamill, and Ford to stardom. A unique merchandising campaign was struck. Toys, t-shirts, and stuff weren't made for major films back in the day. Star Wars changed that, and George Lucas had the merchandising rights, that sneaky son of a gun. The studio gave George Lucas more free reign with the future films he would direct in the series. Two direct sequels were produced, The Empire Strikes Back in 1980 and The Return of the Jedi in 1983. In 1999, a new trilogy began acting as a prequel trilogy chronicling the events of the original trilogy, those films being The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. I think we all know how those turned out. They were not well received. The year 2013 saw a new beginning for Star Wars when Disney bought Lucasfilm and began work on another trilogy of films, these acting as sequels to the original trilogy. So the originals came out, and then the prequels came out, and then the sequels came out. So you just got to draw your lines in your head. Um, the Force Awakens was released in 2015. The Last Jedi was released last year, and the yet-to-be-untitled Episode Nine is due out next year. We've also had two standalone anthology films released, Rogue One in 2016 and recently Solo last month. There may or may not be more Star Wars story films coming soon. And in between all of this have been various animated television series, comic series, novels, video games, etc. There were some television specials. I've heard rumor of a holiday special, but I've never seen any evidence to suggest it's real. It's not. Don't exist. It's not. In recent years, Star Wars has gained a large presence at Disneyland and Walt Disney World with an entire extension to both parks opening next year. Though they've had Star Wars and Jedi Training Academy for many years prior, um, the First Order marches through the streets every day. You can meet BB-8 and Kylo Ren and Chewbacca. I unfortunately met Kylo Ren, as you see here. Someone told him I was with the Resistance. He did not take too well to that. I'm still shaking. Uh, <laughs> Star Wars has been the subject of many tributes and satires across many films and television shows for years. The cast appeared on an episode of The Muppet Show, Robot Chicken has made several parodies, Animaniacs did a satirical retelling of the original film, and Family Guy retold the entire trilogy as only Family Guy can. Saturday Night Live has done its fair share of parodies. The characters of How I Met Your Mother have shared their love of the franchise numerous times throughout the show. The DC superhero show Legends of Tomorrow traveled back in time to when George Lucas was still in film school. And of course, how could we forget Mel Brooks' classic 1987 satire, Spaceballs. I could go on and on, but Star Wars has had a major lasting impact on pop culture. And that impact shows obviously no signs of lessening despite the vicious debates fans old and new wage on Twitter and the like. But what gave Star Wars the power to last so long? What did first audiences see on that screen 41 years ago? The story is quite simple when you think about it, at least from the beginning. It was a galactic fairy tale about a young boy and a swashbuckling rogue going off to rescue a princess in space with the help of a wizard. Again, harking back to Joseph Campbell, it closely follows the hero's journey formula. It gave audiences a lot of likable characters to root for. It rejuvenated the sci-fi genre, and it also put some energy back into film. As I said earlier, cinema had gotten rather downtrodden and cynical with films like Chinatown and The Towering Inferno that didn't have happy endings or leave the audience with good feelings. Movies like all entertainment are sort of an escape from reality, but when films are as grim as reality, which at the time included the end of the Vietnam War, the Watergate scandal, uh, President Ford was almost assassinated twice, Elvis died, Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Star Wars provided a positive alternative for the first time in a while. 
It reminded the audiences that they could have fun going to the movies again. And like a lot of movies, it inspires us, helps us believe in a better world around us, that things aren't all bad and they can get better. And quite simply, it gives us, to quote Princess Leia, hope. Thank <laughs> you.